Chapter four of the Memoirs of Chateaubriand, 1768 to 1800. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee, Memoirs of Chateaubriand, 1768 to 1800, by Francois René de Chateaubriand. Chapter four. My maternal grandmother and her sister, their mode of life at Plancouet, my uncle, Count de Bedet, at Montchoix, my nurse's vow. When nearly seven years of age, I was taken by my mother to Plancouet to be released from my nurse's vow. We went to the house of my grandmother, and if ever I knew happiness, it was certainly during the time I remained under her roof. My grandmother resided in the village of La Baye, in a house with an adjoining garden. This garden descended in terraces to a little dell, in the depth of which there was a fountain surrounded by willows. Madame de Bedé was no longer able to walk, but with that exception, she suffered none of the infirmities of age. She was an agreeable old lady, fat, fair, and comely. Her air was dignified, and her manners were elegant. Her dresses were made in a very old-fashioned style, and she wore a black lace cap tied under the chin. Her mind was cultivated, and her conversation and manners were marked by gravity. Her sister, Madame de Boiteu, resided with her. This lady resembled my grandmother in nothing but in goodness. She was small and thin, lively and talkative, with a turn for raillery. She had once been attached to a certain Count de Tremigon, whom she had promised to marry, but she did not fulfil her promise. My aunt was a poetess, and she used to amuse herself by inditing verses to the memory of her youthful love. I well recollect her as she sat, spectacles on nose, embroidering a pair of double ruffles for her sister, and whilst plying the busy needle she would partly hum, partly sing, a quaint ditty commencing thus, Un épervier aimé une fauvette, et se dit-on, et l'honnêté aimé. This attachment on the linnet's part always, I must confess, appeared to me somewhat strange. The burden of each verse was, Ah, Chemigan, la fable est elle obscure, Turelure. How many things in this world end like my aunt's love in Turelure. My grandmother consigned to her sister the superintendence of the household. She dined at the primitive hour of eleven in the forenoon, and after dinner she took her siesta. She rose again at one o'clock, when she was carried out to the lower terrace of the garden, where, beneath the shade of the billows overhanging the fountain she used to sit and knit attended by her sister her children and her grandchildren in those days old age was a dignity in these times it is a burden at four in the afternoon my grandmother was carried into her drawing-room where the servant pierre used to set out a card-table this being done mademoiselle de boiteu would take the fire-tongs and tap against the back of the chimney and in a few minutes after this summons there entered three old maiden ladies who resided in the next house these were three sisters, the Demoiselles Vildeneux, daughters of a poor nobleman of the olden time. Instead of parcelling out their scanty inheritance into shares, they preferred keeping it undivided and enjoying it in common with each other. They had always lived together, and had never resided out of their paternal village. They had known my grandmother from their childhood. They lived next door to her, and they regularly came every day when my aunt gave her signal with the fire-tongs to play a game at quadrille with their aged friend. The game being commenced, the good ladies would sometimes quarrel over it. These little card-table disputes were the only stirring events of their lives, the only circumstances which disturbed their equanimity of temper. At eight o'clock the announcement of supper never failed to restore serenity. My uncle de Bedet, with his son and three daughters, frequently came to sup with my grandmother. On these occasions the old lady would relate some stories of her youth, and my uncle would describe the Battle of Fontenoy, in which he had been engaged. Then, having recounted his own deeds of valour, he would tell some humorous anecdotes which made the good ladies almost die of laughter. At nine o'clock, supper being ended, the servants were summoned, and whilst all knelt devoutly, Mademoiselle de Boiteuil repeated the evening prayer. At ten o'clock the whole household was asleep, with the exception of my grandmother, whose femme de chambre used to read to her till one in the morning. This was the first social circle which I had had the opportunity of seeing and knowing, and it was also the first that was swept away under my observance. I saw death enter that abode of peace and happiness, successively diminishing its inmates, first one chamber, then another being closed, never again to be opened. I saw my good grandmother renounce her game at quadrille, for want of her usual partners. I saw the number of her faithful friends gradually diminish, until she herself descended into the grave. She and her sister had mutually promised that the one who died first should speedily summon the other to follow. This promise was kept and Madame de Bedet survived Mademoiselle de Boiteu only a few months. I am now perhaps the only person in the world who knows that all these beings once existed. How many times in the course of my life have I witnessed the recurrence of similar circumstances? 
how frequently have i seen a circle of friends formed and dissolved around me the impossibility of prolonging the duration of human attachments the profound oblivion which follows us the unbroken silence that reigns over the grave seem unceasingly to impress on the mind the necessity of retirement any hand will serve to present a glass of water to cool the parched lip in the fever of death it is well when that hand is not too dear to us when it is not the hand we have covered with kisses and which we could wish to press eternally to our heart the chateau of the count de bedet which was about a league from planquet stood on an elevated and pleasant site my uncle's gaiety of spirit was inexhaustible and its joyous influence was shared by all around him he had three daughters caroline marie and flore and one son the count de la Buetade, a parliament councillor who inherited his father's cheerful temper the chateau of montchois was always filled with visitors chiefly consisting of the youthful cousins of the family the young people amused themselves with music dancing and hunting and there was a perpetual round of diversion from morning to night the countess de bedet seeing my uncle thus dissipating his fortune manifested some reasonable degree of uneasiness but her remonstrances were not heeded indeed her displeasure served only as a subject of raillery to the other members of the family for the fact was my aunt had her own tastes and she loved to indulge them these tastes were somewhat whimsical for example she kept an ill-tempered growling dog which she nursed and fondled and she had a wild boar which she was endeavouring to tame and whose grunting was heard from one end of the chateau to the other when i came from my father's house which was so dull and silent to this scene of gaiety and animation i could almost have fancied myself in paradise the contrast became the more striking when the residence of my family was permanently fixed in the country to go from combourg to montchois was like going from a desert into the inhabited world or from the castle of a baron of the middle ages to the villa of a roman prince on ascension day in the year seventeen seventy five i left my grandmother's house accompanied by my mother my aunt de boiteil my uncle de bedet and his children my nurse and my brother we proceeded to the church of notre dame de nazareth i wore a white garment which in those days was called a levite my shoes my gloves and my hat were likewise white and round my waist was tied a sash or scarf of blue silk it was about ten o'clock in the morning when we reached the abbey the convent stood near the roadside and was shaded by a quincunx of elm trees planted in the time of john v of brittany this quincunx led to the cemetery the christian reached the church only after having crossed the region of the sepulchre in like manner through death we enter into the presence of god the monks had already ranged themselves in the stalls the altar was illuminated by a multitude of tapers and lamps were suspended from the vaulted roof there is something in the effect of old gothic arches which resembles distant and successive horizons the mace-bearers came to the door to receive me with ceremony and they conducted me to the choir where three seats were placed the middle one was assigned to me my nurse seated herself at my left and my foster-brother at my right the mass commenced during the offertory the officiating priest turned to me and read the prayers at their conclusion i was divested of my white garments which were hung as an ex photo under an image of the virgin after this i was arrayed in a violet-coloured dress the prior delivered an oration on the efficacy of vows touching on the history of the baron de chateaubriand who went to the holy land with st louis he observed that possibly it might be my lot to visit in palestine the virgin of nazareth to whom i owed life through the intercession of the prayers of the poor ever acceptable to the ear of god this priest recapitulated the whole history of my family as dante's grandfather recounted to him the history of his ancestors and he might even have predicted my exile in the words of caccia guida tu proverai si come sa di sane il pane altrui e come e duro cale lo scendere e il salir per l'altrui scale e quel che più ti graverà le spalle sarà la compagnia malvagia e scempia con la qual tu cadrai in questa valle che tutta ingrata tutta matta ed empia si farà contra te di sua bestialitate e suo processo sarà la prova si cate sia bello averti fatta parte per se stesso after hearing the exhortation of the priest my thoughts constantly turned on a pilgrimage to jerusalem and at length i performed it i was consecrated to religion on her altar was deposited the guard of my innocence but instead of my garments my miseries may now be hung up in her temples i returned to st malo st malo is not the alatum of the noted here in Perry. alatum was more advantageously placed by the romans in the suburb st servan 
at the military port called Solidor, at the mouth of the Rance. Immediately opposite Alatum was a rock, est in conspectu tenedos, not the refuge of the perfidious Greeks, but the retreat of Aaron the Hermit, who took up his dwelling in this island, in the year 507, the date of the victory of Clovis over Alaric. Aaron founded a small convent, Clovis a mighty monarchy. Both alike have fallen. Malo, in Latin Maclovius, Macutus, Macutes, became bishop of Alatum in 541. He had been attracted thither by the fame of Aaron, and visited him in his island home. He became chaplain of the oratory of the hermit, and after the death of the saint, erected a synobial church in Pradio Machutis. His name was soon after given to the whole island, and subsequently to the city, which was called Maclovium and Maclopolis. A series of forty-five bishops is reckoned from St. Marlow, the first bishop of Alatum, to John the Happy, surnamed de la Grille, who was canonized in 1140. Alatum being at that time almost entirely abandoned, John de la Grille transferred the episcopal see of the Roman city to the Bretagne city, which was beginning to flourish on the rock of Aaron. St. Marlow suffered severely in the wars which took place between the kings of France and England. The Earl of Richmond, afterwards Henry the Seventh of England, in whom terminated the strife between the white and red roses, was carried prisoner to St. Malo. The Duke de Bretagne delivered him up to the ambassadors of Richard, who conveyed him to London, with the intention of putting him to death. But he succeeded in escaping from his guards, and took refuge in the cathedral, as silum quod in ed urbe est in vio latissimum. This rite of sanctuary had its origin with the Druids, the first priests of the Isle of Arran. A bishop of St. Malo was one of the three favourites, the other two being Arthur de Montauban and Jean Angot, who ruined the unfortunate Gilles de Bretagne. This may be seen in L'Histoire Lamentable de Gilles, Seigneur de Chateaubriand et de Chantossé, Prince du Sang de France et de Bretagne, étranglé en prison par les ministres du Favori, le 24 avril, 1550. The capitulation between Henry the Fourth and St. Malo was worthy of both. The city treated as a power within a power, protected those who had taken refuge within its walls, and retained the liberty accorded to it by an ordinance of Philibert de la Guiche, Grand Master of the Artillery of France, to cast a hundred pieces of cannon. No place more closely resembled Venice, its climate and its fine arts excepted, than the small republic of St. Malo in its religion, wealth, and naval exploits. It aided the expedition of Charles V in Africa, and succoured Louis the Thirteenth before La Rochelle. Its flag proudly traversed every sea, maintaining relations with Mocha, Surat, and Pondicherry, and a company formed in the bosom of St. Malo explored the southern ocean. From the time of Henry the Fourth, my native city has been distinguished by its devotion and fealty to France. It was bombarded by the English in 1693, and on the 29th of November that year they threw into it an infernal machine, amid the ruins caused by which I have often played with my companions. They again bombarded it in 1758. The Maloese lent considerable sums of money to Louis the Fourteenth during the War of 1701, and in gratitude for this service, he confirmed to them the privilege of fortifying themselves. He even commanded that the crew of the first vessel of the Royal Marine should be composed exclusively of sailors from St. Malo and its territory. In 1771, the Maloese made fresh sacrifices and lent Louis the Fifteenth thirty millions. The celebrated Admiral Anson landed at Concal in 1758 and burned saint Servin. In the chateau of Saint-Malo, La Chalotais wrote upon linen, with a toothpick dipped in water and soot. Those memoirs which then produced such an immense sensation, and which none remember now. Events efface events. Inscriptions graven over other inscriptions form the pages of the history of palimpsests. Saint-Malo furnished the best sailors for our navy. The general role may be seen in the folio volume entitled Role général des officiers mariniers et matelot de Saint-Malo published in 1682. There is also a Coutume de Saint-Malo, printed in the Recueil du Coutumier Général. The archives of the city are rich in charters, which are useful to the historian and to maritime. Saint-Malo is the place of Jacques Cartier, the Christopher Columbus of France, who discovered Canada. The Maloese obtained fresh renown at the other extremity of America, in the islands which bear their name. Saint-Malo is the native city of Duguay Chouin, one of the greatest naval men that ever appeared, and in our days it has given to France a celebrated Circouf. The renowned Mahé de la Bourdonnais, governor of the Mauritius, was born at Saint-Malo, as were also La Métrie, Maupetri, and the Abbé Troublet, whom Voltaire made an object of his wit. This is by no means an insignificant list for a place not equal in extent to the Garden of the Tuileries. 
The Abbé de Lamennais has left far behind him these lesser literary stars of my country. Brousset likewise was born at Saint-Malo, as well as my noble friend, the Count de la Ferronnay. In order to make any omission, I must call to mind those celebrated bulldogs, which constituted the garrison of Saint-Malo. They were descendants of those famous dogs reared in the regiments of the Gauls, and who, according to Strabo, stood up in battle array with their masters against the Romans. Albert Le Grand, a monk of the order of St. Dominic, an author as grave as the Greek geographer declares, that at Saint-Malo the guardianship of a place so important was committed every night to the fidelity of certain bulldogs, who formed an admirable and safe patrol. They were at last condemned to capital punishment for having had the misfortune of inconsiderately eating the legs of a gentleman. This has given rise in our days to the song Bon Voyage, where the whole is turned into ridicule. The criminals are imprisoned, one of them refuses to take the nourishment presented by the hand of his disconsolate guardian, the noble animal starves himself to death. The dogs are punished like men for their fidelity. Moreover, the capital was, like my Delos, guarded by dogs, who never barked when Scipio Africanus came to offer his prayers at dawn of day. Samalo is enclosed by walls of diverse eras, which are divided into large and small, with a promenade running along the top. The city is further defended by the chateau of which I have spoken, and which was enlarged with towers, bastions, and trenches by the Duchess Anne. Seen from without, this insulated city resembles the citadel of granite. It is upon the shore of the widespread sea between the chateau and Fort Royal that the children assemble to play, and here it is that I was educated, the companion of the winds and waves. One of the first pleasures which I enjoyed was to combat with the storms, and to sport with the surges which retired before me, or pursued me on the beach. Another amusement was to build little structures with the sands of the shore, which my companions called ovens. Since that time I have often seen castles built for eternity crumble more rapidly than my palaces of sand. My lot being irrevocably fixed, I was left to pass my infancy in idleness. Some notions of drawing, of the English language, hydrography, and mathematics appeared more than sufficient for the education of a young boy destined beforehand to the rude life of a mariner. I grew up in my family without study. We no longer inhabited the house where I was born. My mother occupied an hotel in the Place Saint-Vincent, nearly opposite the gate which led to Sion. The young polisson of the city were my dearest friends, and the court and stairs of our house were always crowded with them. I resembled them in everything, spoke their language, assumed their manner and gait, was dressed like them, and my clothes like theirs were open and unbuttoned, and my shirt in tatters. My stockings were always full of holes, my shoes slipped shod and down at heel, and my feet coming out at every step. I constantly lost my cap and often my jacket. My face was besmeared, scratched and bruised, and my hands were black and grubby. My appearance was altogether so strange that my mother, in the heat of her anger, could not often help laughing and crying out, How ugly he is! Notwithstanding all this, I loved, and ever have loved, cleanliness, nay, even elegance. At night I endeavoured to patch my tattered garments, and good Villeneuve and my Lucille used to help me to repair my toilette, in order to prevent my getting punished and scolded, but their patchings only made my clothes look the more ridiculous. I was often miserable, especially when I appeared in my ranks among children who were proud of their new clothes and fine appearance. There was something foreign in the character of my country people, which called to mind the Spaniards. Maloese families were established at Cadiz, and Cadiz families resided at Saint-Malo. The insular position, causeway, architecture, houses, cisterns, and granite walls of Saint-Malo gave it a resemblance to Cadiz, and when I visited that city I was often reminded of Saint-Malo. The Maloese locked up at night in their city by the same key, constituted one family. Their manners were so simple that young women who sported the ribbons and gauzes of Paris were looked upon as worldly-minded and shunned by their alarmed companions. For any to go astray was an unheard-of event, and a Countess d'Abbeville, having been suspected, a complaint ensued, which the people sung to her while making the sign of the cross. However, the poet, faithful in spite of himself to the traditions of the troubadours, took part against the husband, whom he called a monstre barbare. On certain days of the year, the inhabitants of the city and the country met together at fairs called assemblées, which were held in the islands and on the forts around Saint Malo. They repaired thither on foot when the tide was low, and in boats when it was high. The multitude of sailors and peasants, the carts with linen awnings, the caravans of horses, asses, and mules, the crowd of merchants, the tents pitched on the beach, the processions of monks and friars, who meandered with their banners and their crosses in the midst of the crowd, the boats coming to the shore, either sailing or rowing, the vessels entering the port or lying at anchor, the salutes of artillery, 
all contributed to infuse into these meetings bustle life and variety i was the only witness of these fates who shared not in their joy i appeared there without money in my pocket for purchasing either toys or cakes shunning the disdain which is attached to poverty i seated myself far from the crowd amid the surf which the sea forms in the hollows of the rocks there i amused myself in watching the flights of the penguins and seagulls in gazing on the far blue distance in picking up cockle shells and listening to the refrain of the waves among the rocks in the evening when at home i was scarcely more happy i had a repugnance to certain food which i was forced to eat and i was wont to cast my imploring eyes upon la france who adroitly carried off my plate when my father turned his head another way another grievance was that i was never permitted to approach the fireplace very different were my severe parents to those who in these days spoil their children but if i had sorrows which are unknown to the rising generation i had also pleasures of which they are ignorant we no longer know anything of those religious and family solemnities where the whole of the country seemed to rejoice with their god christmas new year's day the epiphany easter whitsuntide and st john's day these were days of joy and happiness to me it may be that the influence of my native rock acted upon my feelings and pursuits from the year ten fifteen the malouis had made a vow that they would go and assist in erecting with their own hands and by their own means the belfry of the cathedral of chartres have not i also thus laboured with my hands to rebuild the fallen spire of the ancient christian church the sun says father monoir has never shone upon a canton where there has appeared a more constant and invariable fidelity to the true faith than in bretagne for thirteen centuries no infidelity has stained the language which has served as the organ for preaching jesus christ and he is yet to be born who shall hear in bretagne the preaching of another religion than the catholic in the language of bretagne during those fate days to which i have alluded i was taken with my sisters to make a short stay at the different sanctuaries in the city to the chapel of st Aaron, to the convent de la victoire my ear was struck with the soft voices of females who were invisible the harmony of their songs mingled with the murmur of the waves in the winter at the christmas festival when the cathedral was filled by crowds the old sailors on their knees the young women and children reading in their missals holding little lighter tapers in their hands the multitude at the moment of the blessing repeating in chorus the tantum ergo when during the interval of the chants the bleak wind beat against the windows of the church shaking the vaults of that nave where once the manly voices of jacques cartier and of Gigui chouin had ascended i was overpowered by an extraordinary feeling of religion i had no need to be told by villeneuve to fold my hands and to call upon god by all the names which my mother had taught me i saw the heavens open and the angels offering our incense and our vows i bowed my head it was no longer depressed with that overwhelming weariness which almost tempts us never more to raise it after it has once been bowed at the foot of the altar one sailor on quitting these pomps embarks in his vessel fortified against every trial while another coming into port directs his steps to the illuminated dome of the church thus religion and peril were continually present and their images manifested themselves inseparably to my mind scarcely was i born when i heard of death that evening a man with a bell in his hand walked from street to street calling upon christians to offer up their prayers for one of their deceased brethren almost every year vessels were lost in my very sight and as i played on the shore the sea dashed at my feet the dead bodies of men who had died far from their homes madame de chateaubriand said to me as the holy monica said to her son nihil longe est adeo nothing is far from god my education had been confided to providence and it did not fail to furnish me with lessons dedicated to the virgin i knew and loved my protectress whom i confounded with my guardian angel her image which had cost my good villeneuve half a sou was attached with four pins to the head of my bed i ought to have lived in those days when they were wont to say to the virgin douce dame du ciel et de la terre mère de pitié fontaine de tout bien qui portasse jésus-christ en vos précieux flancs belle très douce dame je vous merci et vous prie the first thing which i learned by heart was a mariner's song commencing thus je mette ma confiance vierge en votre secours servez moi de défense prenez soin de mes jours et quand ma dernière heure viendra fini mon sort obtenez que je meure de la pluie sainte mort i have since heard these lines sung during a shipwreck i repeat them to this very day with as much delight as i do the verses of homer a madonna encircled with a gothic crown veiled in a robe of blue silk with a silver fringe inspires me with more devotion than a virgin of raphael this peaceful star of the ocean might have calmed the troubles of my life but i was destined to be agitated even in my infancy 
like the date tree of the arab scarcely had the tender blade sprung out of the rock than it was beaten down by the winds End of chapter four chapter five of the memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicole lee memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred by francois rene de chateaubriand chapter five la vallee aux loups june eighteen twelve Gerille, heavy in magon fight with two sailor boys i have already said that my premature revolt against the bon who ruled lucile was the commencement of my disgrace it was completed by one of my companions my uncle m de chateaubriand du plessis who like his brother was settled at st malo had like him four daughters and two sons my two cousins pierre and armand at first constituted all my society but pierre was appointed page to the queen and armand being destined for the ecclesiastical state was sent to college Pierre, on quitting the Queen's service, entered the navy and was drowned on the coast of Africa. Armand, after having been shut up for many years at college, left France in 1790, served throughout the whole of the emigration, undauntedly made five voyages in a sloop to the coast of Bretagne, and afterwards died for his king on the plains of Grenelle on Good Friday, 1810. I have already mentioned this, and shall again have occasion to revert to it when recounting his untimely fate. Being thus deprived of the society of my two cousins, I endeavoured to fill up the void by a new acquaintance a gentleman named Gerril lived on the second floor of the hotel which we inhabited he had one son and two daughters the education of the son was diametrically opposite to mine he was a thoroughly spoiled child and everything that he did was thought charming his great delight was fighting and especially exciting quarrels of which he constituted himself umpire he was constantly playing pranks upon the bon when they walked out with the children the main subject of their gossip was his frolics which they magnified into deadly crimes his father merely laughed at these pranks and joson gerille was not a whit the less beloved he soon became my most intimate friend and exercised unbounded sway over me i made great progress under such a master although my character was entirely opposite to his i was fond of solitary sports and never sought a quarrel with any one whereas gerille was mad after pleasure and clamour and childish squabbles were the joy of his heart if any of the young polissons came up to speak to me gerald would exclaim do you permit that at these words i thought my honour compromised and i would fly at the head of the audacious intruder age or height was nothing to me my friend would look on and applaud my courage but he never came to my assistance sometimes he would raise an army of all the young idlers whom we met and then dividing his conscripts into two bands we commenced a regular skirmish with volleys of stones on the beach another game invented by gerald was of a more dangerous nature when the sea ran high and there was a storm the waves lashed the foundations of the ancient chateau rushed upon the shore and dashed even as high as the large towers about twenty feet above the elevation of the base of these towers was a parapet of granite straight slippery and sloping which communicated with the ravelin that defended the moat the point to be accomplished was to seize the instant between the two waves and clear the perilous slope before the wave could break and cover the tower behold a mountain of water rapidly advancing with a roaring voice if you delay one single moment the monster will either engulf you or dash you against the wall not one of us ever refused this hazardous feat but i have seen many a boy turn pale before he attempted it this penchant gerial to thrust others into dangerous adventures while he remained an idle spectator induced the impression that he did not on the whole display a very generous character it was he nevertheless who on a very small scale has perhaps outdone the heroism of regulus rome and titus livius alone were wanting to complete his glory in after life he became a naval officer and was taken prisoner at the engagement of quiberon the action was finished and the english continued to cannonade the republican army gerald threw himself into the sea swam up to the vessel told the english to cease their fire and announced to them the misfortune and capitulation of the emigrants the english wished to save him and throwing out a rope conjured him to lay hold of it and come on board i am a prisoner on parole cried he from the bosom of the waves and swam back to the shore he was shot with sombre and his companions gerald was my first friend we were both ill understood in our childhood we were bound together by an instinct the value of which we learned at a future day two adventures put a stop to this first part of my history and produced a complete change in the system of my education one sunday we were on the shore at the portcullis of the gate of st thomas and along the sion 
huge piles rammed into the sand protected the walls against the sea we used to climb to the top of these piles and watch the first undulations of the coming tide as they passed beneath us we had taken our places as usual and several little girls had joined us i was seated nearly at the outer extremity having before me a pretty little girl Hervine magon who laughed with joy and wept with fear gerald was seated on the land side of these piles the wave approached and there was a good deal of wind the bon and other servants cried out come down miss come down sir gerald however waited for a huge wave and as soon as it had rushed beneath the piles he gave the child that was seated just before him a good push she of course fell forward upon the next and that one again upon her neighbour and thus the whole file fell forward as if moved by machinery each was upheld by the one in advance except the little girl at the extremity of the line i fell forward upon her and not having any one to support her she of course fell down the tide carried her away shrieks resounded on every side and the nurses tucking up their gowns rushed into the water and each seizing her charge gave it a slap evine was fished up again and declared it was francois who had thrown her down the bon fell upon me but i made my escape and rushing home with an army of women at my heels barricaded myself in the cellar happily my father and mother were not within villeneuve valiantly defended the door and heartily cuffed the avant-garde of the enemy the real author of all this mischief gerald at last brought me succour he rushed upstairs to his own apartment and with his two sisters threw down pitchers full of water and boiled potatoes upon the heads of the assailants they raised the siege with the approach of night but the story spread like wildfire through the city and the chevalier de chateaubriand aged nine years passed for an atrocious man a remnant of those pirates of whom the holy aaron had purged his rocky island and now for another adventure i was going with gerial to saint servan a suburb of st malo from which it is divided by the trading port in order to get there when the tide was out we had to clear the little streams of water by passing over narrow bridges of flat stones which were covered at high tide the servants who accompanied us had remained a long way behind at the extremity of one of these bridges we saw two sailor boys coming towards us gerald cried out what shall we suffer these young scoundrels to pass us and then calling to them exclaimed get into the water you ducks the said ducks however having the quality of sailors and not understanding his raillery continued to advance gerald drew back we placed ourselves at the end of the bridge and began pelting them with stones they threw themselves upon us compelled us to take to our heels and furnishing themselves with pebbles they continued pelting us till we fell back upon our reserve corps that is to say our nursery maids i was not indeed like horatius struck in the eye but one of the stones hit my left ear so forcibly that it was half cut off and hung down upon my shoulder i thought not of my misfortune but of the reception which i should meet with at home if my friend got a black eye a torn jacket or a bruised shin in his adventures he was pitied caressed and fondled and supplied with new clothes but as for me when i was in a similar plight i was severely scolded and punished the wound which i had received was dangerous but i was so excessively frightened that la france with all her entreaty could not prevail upon me to return home i went upstairs and took shelter in my friend's apartments gerial bound up my head with a napkin but this napkin again set him off it looked to him like a mitre and he accordingly transformed me into a bishop and made me sing high mass with him and his sisters till supper-time the pontiff was then compelled to go down but oh how did my heart beat my father surprised at my disordered look and the blood upon my face said not a word but my mother uttered a shriek la france related my piteous tale in which she contrived so completely to exculpate me that i happily escaped all punishment my ear was dressed and monsieur and madame de chateaubriand resolved to separate me from gerial as soon as possible i do not recollect whether it was this year that count d'artois came to st malo on which occasion a naval engagement was given in his honour i saw the young prince standing on the bastion of the powder-mill while i was among the crowd on the sea-shore what unknown destinies were involved in his splendour and in my obscurity if my memory does not mislead me st malo has been visited by only two of the kings of france charles the ninth and charles x such is the picture of my early childhood i know not whether the severe education which i received be good in principle but it was adopted by my relations without design and in consequence of their natural temperament so much however is certain that it made my ideas less similar to those of other men and it is yet more certain that it imparted to all my feelings a tone of melancholy arising from the habit of continual suffering at an age of weakness thoughtlessness and joy is it asked whether this mode of bringing me up led me to detest the authors of my existence by no means the remembrance of their rigour is almost agreeable to me i esteem and honour their noble qualities on the death of my father my comrades in the regiment of navarre were witnesses of my grief 
to my mother i owe all the consolations of my life because from her i received my religious impressions i cherish the truths which fell from her lips with the devotion with which pierre de langre studied at dead of night in a solitary church by the light of a lamp which burned before the sacred altar would my mind have been better developed had i been forced to study at an earlier age i doubt it the waves the winds and the solitude which were my first teachers were in harmony with my natural disposition perhaps i owe to these rude instructors some virtues of which i should otherwise have been devoid the truth is that no system of education is in itself preferable to another do children love their parents better in these days when they address them with familiarity and no longer tremble before them gerald was indulged in the paternal home whereas i was continually scolded yet we both grew up men of honour tender and respectful sons the things which you set down as evil may call out the talents of your child and those which in your eyes seem good may stifle those very talents god does well whatever he does it is providence which directs us when it destines us to act a part on the great theatre of the world end of chapter five chapter six of the memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicole lee memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred by francois rene de chateaubriand chapter six dieppe september eighteen twelve note from monsieur pasquier dieppe change in my education spring in bretagne historical forest pelagian champagnes setting of the moon at sea on the fourth of september eighteen twelve i received the following note from monsieur pasquier prefect of police cabinet of the prefect the prefect of police invites monsieur de chateaubriand to take the trouble of coming to his bureau either to-day at four o'clock in the afternoon or to-morrow at nine o'clock in the morning the purport of this note was that the prefect of police desired to communicate to me an order to quit paris i accordingly retired to dieppe the ancient name of which was berteville but afterwards about four hundred years ago it was called dieppe from the english word deep water in seventeen eighty eight i had been in garrison here with the second battalion of my regiment a residence in this city with its clean and well-lighted streets its brick houses and shops filled with ivory carried me back to the days of my youth when i walked abroad i encountered the ruins of the chateau d'arc with its thousand associations nor could i forget that dieppe was the cradle of duquesne when i returned home to my lodging i had before me the widespread ocean from the table at which i was seated i contemplated the sea which had greeted me at my birth and which washed the shores of great britain where i have so long lived in exile my eyes wandered over the waves which had carried me to america rejected me in europe and then taken me back to the shores of africa and asia all hail to thee o ocean my cradle and my image i will tell thee the remainder of my story if i speak falsely thy waves intermingled with my whole career will accuse me of imposture to the men who are yet to come my mother never relinquished her cherished desire that i should receive a classical education the navy for which i was destined might not after all she said suit my taste and it appeared desirable to her that under all circumstances i should be fitted for another career her piety led her to wish that i should decide for the church she therefore proposed that i should be sent to college where i might learn mathematics drawing the english language and military exercises she did not venture to speak of greek or latin for fear of alarming my father but resolved that i should commence secretly and when i had made some progress to proceed openly my father agreed to her proposal and it was determined that i should enter the college of doll preference was given to this city because it lay on the road from st malo to combourg during the very severe winter which preceded my scholastic seclusion a fire broke out in the hotel where we resided i was saved by my elder sister who carried me through the midst of the flames m de chateaubriand retired to his chateau desired his wife to come to him but he could not join her till the spring the spring in bretagne is more genial than in the environs of paris and the blossoms are more than three weeks in advance the five birds which announced the coming spring the swallow the lorist the cuckoo the quail and the nightingale arrived with the breakers which sought shelter in the gulfs of the Armorican peninsula the ground was clad with daisies pansies jonquils narcissus hyacinths ranunculus anemones like the wild spots which surround st john of lateran and the holy cross of jerusalem at rome the glades were diversified with the blended tints of tall and elegant firs intermingled with the flowers of the broom and the firs so brilliant that they might have been mistaken for gold-winged butterflies the hedges which abounded with wild strawberries raspberries and sweet-smelling violets were decked with the hawthorn honeysuckle and briar 
whose dark and entwining stems were covered with blossoms and magnificent foliage bees birds and butterflies animated every place and the numerous birds nests arrested the steps of children at every turn here and there in some sheltered spot the laurel rose and the myrtle flourished in the open air as in greece the fig tree yielded its fruit as in provence and every apple tree with its carmine flowers resembled the bouquet of a village bride in the twelfth century the cantons of fougeres rennes becherel dinan st malo and dol were occupied by the forests of brecheliens it had been the battlefield of the franks and of the people of the domonais waste relates that the savage the fountain of berenton and the golden basin might be seen here an historical document of the fifteenth century usement et coutume de la forêt de brésilien confirms the romance of rue it states that it is large and of vast extent has four castles a great number of beautiful ponds fine hunting tracks where no noxious bees are found nor flies molest the traveller two hundred forests and as many springs especially the fountain of belenton by the side of which the chevalier pontus commenced his campaigns to this day the country preserves the traits of its origin intersected by wooded trenches it presents from afar the appearance of a forest and reminds one of england it is the abode of fairies and you will learn by and by that i actually encountered a sylph there the narrow valleys are watered by little rivers which are not navigable and separated by heaths and lofty forests of holly and vines along the coast rise a succession of lighthouses watch-towers dolmens roman buildings ruins of castles of the middle ages and belfries of the times of the renaissance and the whole is bounded by the sea pliny says of britannia peninsule spectatrice de l'océan between the ocean and the land extend the pelagian champagnes the indecisive frontiers of the two elements here the field lark and the lark of the ocean fly side by side the plough and the boat are a stone's throw from each other furrowing the land and the water the navigator and the shepherd mutually interchange their language the sailor speaks of the vague mouton and the shepherd of the flotte de mouton the diverse coloured sands the variegated banks of marine shells the seaweed the fringes of silver foam mark the golden or verdant outline of the wavy corn i know not in what island of the mediterranean i have seen a bas-relief representing the nereides attaching festoons to the hem of the garment of cirrus but the object of the greatest admiration in bretagne is the moon rising on the land and setting in the sea constituted by god arbitress of the deep the moon has her wanes her vapours her rays her eclipses like the sun but unlike him she retires not solitary a cortege of brilliant stars accompanies her to her rest in proportion as on my native shore she gradually descends the sky she increases its silence which she communicates to the sea soon she sinks to the horizon intersects it shows only the half of her countenance overcome by sleep she gently inclines and then disappears in the soft swelling of the waves the starry retinue of this queen before plunging to follow her seemed to stop suspended on the crested waves to wish their last good night the moon has no sooner sunk to rest than a stiff breeze springs up and effaces the image of the constellations as the lamps of the festal hall are extinguished when the queen of the feast has withdrawn her shining presence End of chapter six Chapter seven of the Memoirs of Chateaubriand, seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. Memoirs of Chateaubriand, seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred by Francois Rene de Chateaubriand. Chapter seven. Departure for Combourg. Description of the chateau. I was to accompany my sisters to Combourg, and we commenced our journey thither in the early part of May we that is to say my mother my four sisters and i left st malo at sunrise in a huge old-fashioned coach with double gilt panels and projecting steps and purple tassels pendant from the four corners of the roof we were drawn by eight horses decked like the mules in spain with bells at their necks and bridles caparisoned with trappings and fringes of diverse coloured wools my mother sighed and my sisters kept chattering till they were out of breath as for me i sat and listened with both my ears and had my eyes wide open full of astonishment at every turn of the road it was the first step of the wandering jew which could never afterwards be arrested yet if man merely changes his place of abode his days and his heart change also we rested our horses at a small fishing village on the shores of Concal. we then traversed the marshes and the aguish city of dol passed the gates of the college which i was soon to enter and then struck into the interior of the country for four long hours we saw nothing but heaths fringed with wood stunted firs patches of miserable short black corn presenting a wretched prospect for the future 
colliers were leading trains of puny horses with long shaggy manes peasants clad in goatskins and wearing lanky hair were urging on their lean kind with shrill cries and following a heavy plough such as is used by the foresters at length we descried a valley in the distance at the bottom of which rose the spire of a church of a country town close to a little pond the battlements of a feudal chateau towered proudly amid the trees of a forest lighted up by the setting sun while penning these lines i was obliged to pause my heart beat as if it would push back the table at which i was writing the souvenirs which were suddenly awakened in my memory completely overcame me by their force and multitude yet after all what are they to the rest of the world descending the hill we forded a river and after having followed the main road for a quarter of an hour we suddenly quitted the direct line and the carriage turned off at right angles into a most beautiful avenue of elm trees the tops of which formed an arch above our heads i remember even now the moment when i entered this sombre shade and the mixture of joy and terror which i experienced issuing from the obscurity of the wood we crossed a forecourt planted with nut trees adjoining the house and garden of the steward thence we proceeded by a beaten road to a verdant lawn called la cour verte to the right was a long row of stables and a clump of chestnuts and to the left was another cluster of these noble trees at the further extremity of the lawn the ground gradually ascended and the chateau rose between two groups of trees the stern and melancholy façade presented a curtain with a narrow covered denticulated gallery this curtain united two towers unlike in age material height and size the towers were surmounted by pinnacles above which rose a pointed roof like a cap placed upon a gothic crown a grated window appeared here and there upon the naked wall a large flight of steps straight and steep twenty-two in number without rails or balustrades replaced the ancient drawbridge over the moat which had been filled up it led to the portal of the chateau in the middle of the curtain above this portal were the arms of the lords of combourg and the loopholes from which the chains and rests of the drawbridge formerly issued the carriage stopped at the foot of the grand staircase my father came down to receive us the meeting with his family so softened his feelings for the moment that he welcomed us with a smiling countenance we ascended the peril and entered a vestibule with a vaulted roof and from this vestibule we went into a small inner hall this hall led into the building which faced the south and looked out upon the pond and was joined by two little towers the whole chateau had the appearance of a chariot on four wheels we then entered on the same floor into a large hall formerly called salle des gardes a window was open at each extremity and two others intersected the lateral line in order to enlarge these four windows it had been necessary to excavate the walls which were from eight to ten feet thick two corridors with inclined planes like the corridor of the great pyramid divided the two outer angles of the hall and led to the two little towers a winding staircase in one of these towers maintained the communication between the salle des gardes and the upper story such was the construction of our dwelling the body of the façade of the high and the wide tower which commanded the north on the side of the cour verte was composed of a square dark kind of dormitory which was used as a kitchen this abutted upon the vestibule the perron and the chapel above these apartments was the hall of the archives or as it was indifferently called the hall of armour of birds or of chevaliers from the ceiling being decorated with coloured shields and painted birds the embrasures of the narrow trefoil windows were so deep that they formed little chambers around which ran a granite seat added to this there were in different parts of the building passages secret stairs dark cells dungeons a labyrinth of open and covered galleries and secret vaults the ramifications of which were unknown silence darkness and a stony front everywhere appeared such was the castle of combourg supper was served in the salle des gardes i partook of it without constraint and thus terminated the first happy day of my life true happiness costs but little that which is dearly bought is not genuine i was scarcely awake the next morning when i arose to explore the precincts of the castle and to celebrate my arrival at this solitude the flight of steps faced the north-west and when seated on its diazone i had before me the cour verte and beyond it a kitchen garden lying between two woods the one to the right the quincunx by which we had entered which was called le petit mai the other to the left le grand mai this was a forest of oaks beeches sycamores elm and chestnut trees madame de sevigny boasted in her day of the splendid foliage of these ancient trees since that time one hundred and forty years have added to their beauty on the opposite side to the south and east the landscape was quite different the windows of the great hall looked out upon the houses of combourg 
on a pond the causeway over which the main road of wren passed a water-mill a meadow covered with flocks and herds and separated from the pond by the main road on the border of this meadow lay a scattered hamlet which was dependent upon a priory founded in eleven forty nine by rivaillon lord of combourg and where his statue in a recumbent posture and clad in his knight's armour was still to be seen beyond this pond the ground gradually rose and formed an amphitheatre of trees studded with the cottages of the villages and castles of the nobility at the extremity of the horizon to the west and south the heights of becherel might be discerned a terrace bordered with large closely clipped box trees surrounded the foot of the chateau on this side passed behind the stables and continued with an opening here and there as far as the jardin des bains which communicated with the grand mai but after all this long description if an artist were to take out his pencil could he produce a sketch at all resembling this chateau i believe not and yet my memory presents every object as vividly as though i still beheld it such in all natural things is the impotency of language and the power of recollection in beginning to speak of combourg i sing the first couplets of a plaint which has charms for none but myself ask the shepherd of the tyrol why he delights in those three or four notes which he repeats over and over again to his flocks those mountain notes wafted from echo to echo till they resound from the banks of a torrent to the opposite shore my first day at combourg was of short duration a fortnight had scarcely elapsed when i beheld the arrival of the abbe porchet principal of the college of dol i was committed to his care and followed him in spite of my tears End of chapter seven chapter eight of the memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicole lee memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred by francois rene de chateaubriand chapter eight dieppe september eighteen twelve college of dol mathematics and language traits of memory i was not altogether a stranger to dol my father was prebend as descendant and representative of the house of william de chateaubriand lord de beaufort who in fifteen twenty nine founded one of the first stalls in the choir of the cathedral the bishop of dol m de Hercet, was a friend of my family a prelate of great moderation in politics and who together with his brother the abbe d'Hercet, was shot while on his knees with the crucifix in his hand at quiberon the field of the martyrs on my arrival at college i was committed to the special care of the abbe le prince professor of rhetoric and a profound geometrician he was a man of much genius a great admirer of the arts and a tolerable proficient in portrait painting his countenance was fine and expressive he undertook to make me learn my bezu and the abbe ego third professor became my latin master i studied mathematics in my chamber and latin in the common hall it required some time for a bird of my species to become accustomed to the cage of a college and to regulate my flight by the sound of a bell i could not have those ready friends which fortune gains for nothing could be got by associating with a polisson like me who had not even a weekly allowance and i certainly could not enrol myself among a clientele for i always hated patrons in play i did not pretend to lead any one but i never suffered myself to be led by others i was fit neither for a tyrant nor a slave and i remain so to this very day however it was not long before i became the centre of a party and in after life i exercised the same influence in my regiment simple sub-lieutenant as i was the veteran officers passed their evenings with me and preferred my apartment to the cafe i know not whence this arose it might probably be owing to the ease with which i entered into the minds and feelings of others and understood their manners i loved shooting and hunting as much as reading and writing it is indifferent to me even now whether i speak of the most common things or discuss the most elevated subjects almost insensible to genius nay feeling almost an antipathy towards it it is well for me that i have not actually become a brute no fault was offensive in my sight save mockery and conceit and i could scarcely refrain from punishing the offender i found that others always had some superiority over me and if by accident i felt that i was their superior i was quite embarrassed those talents which had lain dormant during my early education were awakened at college i had a remarkable aptitude for study and was gifted with an extraordinary memory i made rapid progress in mathematics in which i manifested a clearness of perception that astonished the abbe le prince at the same time i evinced a decided taste for languages the rudiments those torments of the schoolboy were learned by me without difficulty 
I waited the hour for my Latin lesson with a kind of impatience, as a recreation from ciphering and geometrical figures. In less than a twelvemonth I was high in the fifth form, and singularly enough my Latin phraseology so naturally resolved itself in pentameter that the Abbe Ego called me a Legiac, a name which I believe I always retained among my companions. With respect to my memory, I will mention two traits. I learned by heart my tables of logarithms, that is to say, a number being given in geometrical proportion, I had to find its solution by memory in an arithmetical proportion, and vice versa. After evening prayer, the principal generally delivered a lecture at the college chapel, of which one of the boys, selected at random, was obliged to give an account. We often came back tired from play, and during prayers were half dead with sleep. We threw ourselves upon the forms, each seeking to hide himself in some dark place, in order to escape notice, and consequently interrogation. There was a particular confessional which was a constant bone of contention, as being a sure retreat. One evening I was so fortunate as to gain this desired haven, and thought myself quite secure from the observation of the principal. Unhappily he perceived my manoeuvre, and determined to make an example of me. He read prosily and deliberately the second part of a sermon, every one fell asleep. I know not how it was, but I happened to remain awake in my snug confessional. The principal, who could see only the tips of my toes, thought that I was nodding like the rest, and all on a sudden apostrophised me, and demanded what he had been reading. This second part of this sermon contained an enumeration of the different ways of sinning against God. I was not only able to repeat the subject matter, but I took up the divisions in their order, and repeated almost word for word several pages of mystic prose, utterly beyond the comprehension of a schoolboy. A murmur of applause ran through the chapel. The principal called me up, and giving me a gentle tap upon the cheek, permitted me, by way of reward, to lie in bed next morning till breakfast-time. I modestly shunned the admiration of my companions, but did not fail to take advantage of the grace awarded to me. This verbal memory, which I have not altogether retained, called forth in me another kind of memory, more remarkable, and which I may hereafter have occasion to mention. One thing humbles me. Memory is often the quality of folly. It is generally possessed by sluggish minds, which it renders yet more dull by the lumber with which it encumbers them. Yet nevertheless, what should we be without memory? We should forget our friendships, our loves, our pleasures, our business. Genius could not store up its ideas. The most affectionate heart would lose its tenderness if memory were gone. Our existence would be reduced to the successive moments of a present which would roll heedlessly away. There would no longer be a past. Miserable that we are. So vain is life. It is naught but the reflex of our memory. End of chapter 8《ラプナイン》の名前は、シャトーブリオン1768-1800 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee, Memoirs of Chateaubriand, 1768-1800 by François René de Chateaubriand, Chapter 9 Dieppe, October 1812 Vacations at Combourg Life at a chateau in a province Feudal manners, inhabitants of Combourg. I used to pass my vacations at Combourg. Life in a chateau in the environs of Paris can afford no idea of that in a chateau in a distant province. The domains of Combourg were nothing more than some open heaths, a few mills, and a couple of forests, Bourgouet and Tarnoyen, in a country where wood was almost valueless. Combourg, however, was rich in feudal privileges. These were of diverse sorts. Some determined certain ground rents for certain concessions, or decree the usages which originated under the ancient political state of things. The rest appear to have arisen from games or pastimes. My father had revived some of the latter privileges for the purpose of avoiding prescription. When all the family were assembled, we took part in these Gothic amusements, the three principal of which were the Saute de Poissonnier, La Quintin, and a fair called Langevin. The peasants in their wooden shoes, men of a France which no longer exists, looked on, as spectators upon the games of a france which no longer exist there were prizes for the conqueror and fines for the vanquished la Quintin kept up the tradition of the tourneys and undoubtedly had reference to the ancient military service of the fiefs it is extremely well described in ducange voce quintana the fines were obliged to be paid in ancient copper coins to the value of two moutons d'or à la couronne de vingt cinq sols parisis each the fair called Langevine was annually held in the meadow with the pond, on the 4th of September, the anniversary of my birth. The vassals were obliged to take arms and come to the chateau to hoist their lord's banner. From thence they repaired to the fair to keep order, and to enforce the payment of a mulct, 
due to the lords of Combourg for every head of cattle, a species of regal law. At these times my father kept open table, and dancing was continued for three days. The gentry in the grand hall, to the scraping of a violin, and the peasantry on the lawn, to the squeaking of a bagpipe. Singing, huzzaing, and firing arquebuses were the order of the day. These noises were mingled with the lowing of the cattle at the fair, the buzz of the crowd that moved backwards and forwards in the gardens and woods, thus once in the year at any rate, something like joy was seen at Combourg. Hence I was so singularly placed in life as to have been present at the La Quintin and at the proclamation of the rights of man, to have seen the burgher militia of a village of Bretagne and the National Guard of France, the banners of the lords of Combourg and the standard of the revolution. I am, as it were, the last witness of these feudal manners. The visitors who were received at the chateau were composed of the inhabitants of the borough and the noblesse of the district. These good people were my first friends. Our vanity assigns too much importance to the part which we play in the world. The burgher of Paris laughs at the burgher of a little town. The court noble scorns the noble of a province. The man of renown disdains the man who is without fame, forgetting that time will do equal justice to their pretensions, and that all are equally ridiculous or indifferent in the eyes of the generation which succeeds them. The chief inhabitant of the place was a Monsieur Potelet, an old captain of an East Indiaman, who repeated over and over again some long and wondrous tales of Pondicherry. As he was relating them, with his elbows resting upon the table, my father always seemed inclined to throw his plate in the face of the prolix narrator. The next personage was a great tobacco merchant, M. Launay de la Billardière, the father of a family which, like that of Jacob, consisted of twelve children, nine daughters and three sons, the youngest of whom, David, was my playfellow. This good man resolved to be a noble in 1789. He chose his time well. In this house there was much forced joy and heavy debt. The Seneschal, Gebert, the fiscal procurator, Petit, the receiver, Corvessier, and the chaplain, the Abbe Chamel, constituted the society of Combourg. Not even at Athens have I met more celebrated personages. M. de Petitbois, M. de Chateau d'Assy, M. de Tanteniac, and one or two other gentlemen used to come on Sundays to hear Mass at the parish church, and afterwards to dine with the Lord of the Manor. We were very intimate with the family of Chemodan, which consisted of the husband and his extremely pretty wife, a natural sister, and several children. They lived at a farm whose only indication of nobility was a pigeon-house. The Tremodans are still living. Wiser and happier than I, they have not lost sight of the towers of the castle, which I quitted thirty years since. They do now what they did when I used to go and eat brown bread at their table. They have not left the port, which I shall never more enter. Perhaps they may be speaking of me at the very moment that I am writing this page. I reproach myself for drawing their name from that obscurity which is their safeguard. They doubted for a long time whether the man of whom they had heard so much was the petit chevalier, the rector or curate of Combourg, also the abbe Sévin, the same whom I used to hear holding forth every Sunday, manifested the like credulity, and could not persuade himself that the polisson, the companion of peasant boys, could be the defender of religion. In the end, however, he believed it, and even quoted me in his sermons, after having dandled me upon his knee. These worthy people who so naturally present themselves to my mind, who saw me such as I was in my infancy and youth, would they know me now, after all the changes which time has made? I should be obliged to tell them my name, before they would press me in their arms. I bring misfortune to my friends. A gamekeeper called Ro, who was attached to me, was killed by a poacher. This murder made an extraordinary impression on me. How strange a mystery is the sacrifice of human life! Why is it that it is the greatest crime, and the greatest glory, to shed the blood of man? My imagination pictures to me my faithful Ro holding his intestines in his hands, and dragging himself along to a little cottage where he died. I conceived the idea of vengeance, and resolved to punish the assassin. In this respect I am singularly constituted. At first I scarcely feel an offence, but it fastens itself upon my memory. The remembrance of it, instead of decreasing, augments with time. It sleeps in my heart for months, for years perhaps, but it suddenly reawakens at some trivial circumstances with renewed force and my wound bleeds more severely than when it was first inflicted. But if I do not forgive my enemies, at all events I never harm them. I am rancorous, but not vindictive. If I have the power to revenge myself, I lose the desire. I should not be dangerous except in misfortune. Those who thought to make me succumb by depressing me deceive themselves. Adversity is for me what the earth was for Antea. I regather strength in the bosom of my mother. If happiness had ever taken me from her arms, it would have stifled me. End of chapter 9
Chapter ten of the Memoirs of Chateaubriand, seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. Memoirs of Chateaubriand, seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred by Francois Rene de Chateaubriand. Chapter ten. Dieppe, October eighteen twelve. Second vacation at Combourg. The Conti Regiment camp at st malo an abbey the theatre marriage of my two elder sisters return to college commencement of a revolution in my mind i returned to dol much to my regret the following year the project of a descent upon guernsey was entertained and a considerable force encamped in the neighbourhood of st malo troops were quartered at combourg m de chateaubriand from a sense of courtesy offered an asylum in his house to the colonels of the regiments of turin and conti one of these was the duc de saint simon the other the marquis de Cosin. every day twenty of the officers were invited to dine at my father's table the jocularity of these strangers annoyed me the walks which they took in the neighbourhood disturbed the peace of my favourite woods the sight of the marquis de Vignancourt galloping under the trees first suggested to my fancy images of travelling when i heard our guests talk of paris and of the court i felt oppressed with a strange sadness i began to form conjectures as to what society might be these were distant and confused and left me bewildered and disturbed like one who surveys the earth from some lofty tower whose summit seems to touch the clouds is seized with dizziness so did i feel while glancing at the world from the tranquil regions of youthful innocence one thing however charmed me this was the parade every day the regiment mounted guard and defiled at the foot of the flight of steps in the cour verte to the sound of the drum and other military music the marquis de cosin offered to show me the camp from the coast to which my father gave his consent m de morandet a man of good family who had been reduced by loss of fortune to undertake the management of the combourg estates accordingly took charge of me to st malo he wore a coat of green camlet with a small silver collar round the throat and a cap of grey felt with a peak in front was drawn over his ears he placed me behind him on the croup of his mare isabella i held by the belt which he wore over his coat and to which his hunting-knife was attached i was enchanted when claude de bouillon and the father of the president de la moignon went as children into the country they were placed in baskets suspended on either side of an ass and as la moignon was lighter than his companion a loaf of bread was placed in his pannier to preserve the balance m de morandet took a cross-road and cheerily did we make our way through wood and river till we came to an abbey belonging to the benedictines as the number of monks who inhabited it had greatly decreased they had just been removed to a head community of their order and we found only the father procurator who was left in charge of the disposal of the furniture and the removal of the fuel he however provided us with an excellent dinner of its kind it was served up in the room which had been the library of the prior and we regaled ourselves with an abundance of fresh eggs and pike and carp of an enormous size beyond the arch of a cloister i perceived some large sycamores bordering a piece of water the woodman's axe struck the venerable trees at the root their leafy summits trembled in the air and they fell as if to afford us a spectacle some carpenters from st malo squared the fallen trunks and hewed off the green branches which fell to the earth like the flowing locks clipped from the head of a youthful novitiate my heart bled at the sight of these despoiled forests and of that deserted monastery the general sacking of religious establishments which has since taken place reminded me of the spoliation of this abbey to me the prognostic of a melancholy future on my arrival at st malo i found the marquis de cosin under his care i passed through the divisions of the camp the tents the piles of arms the noble war chargers formed a fine ensemble with the sea the vessels the fortifications and the distant spires of the city i saw one of those men the last of an era the duc de lausanne pass by at full gallop on a barbary steed the prince of carignan who had just arrived at the camp had married the daughter of monsieur de boisgarin who was rather lame but a very charming person this event caused a great sensation at the time and gave rise to a lawsuit which is still carried on by the elder monsieur de la Cretelle but what has all this to do with my life in proportion says montaigne as the memory of my friends furnish them with circumstantial facts they digress so much that if their narrations were of any worth it was completely neutralized and if otherwise 
woe to their good memory and bad judgment i have known the most entertaining topics rendered perfectly tedious by the manner in which they were related by some man of quality i fear i somewhat resemble this man of quality my brother who was at st malo when m de la morandais brought me thither said to me one evening i will take you to the theatre get your hat i was out of my wits for joy and scarcely knew what i did i ran straight to the basement to fetch my hat which was up in the garret a company of strolling players had just landed i had seen puppet shows and imagined that at the theatre the polichinellos must be very superior to those in the streets with a palpitating heart i arrived at a wooden building in a deserted part of the town i entered one of the dark passages but not without a slight feeling of timidity a small door was opened and i suddenly found myself with my brother in a box which was already half filled the curtain was raised and the piece had just commenced they were acting le père de la famille i saw two men walking about the theatre talking to each other with everybody's eyes fixed upon them i took them for the managers of the puppet show who chatted before the lodge of madame michigan waiting the arrival of the audience i was only astonished that they should talk so loud of their own matters and that they should be listened to with such profound silence my amazement increased when i saw other persons come on the stage and begin gesticulating and weeping and then i saw that everybody began to weep as if by contagion the curtain fell without my having the slightest conception what all this meant my brother went to the green room between the pieces and when i was left alone among strangers which owing to my timid disposition was a real torment to me i heartily wished myself buried at college such was the first impression which i received of the art of sophocles and of moliere the third year of my residence at dol was marked by the marriage of my two elder sisters marianne married the count de marigny and benigne to the count de quebriac they accompanied their husbands to fougeres a signal as it were for the dispersion of our family the members of which were so soon to separate my sisters both received the nuptial benediction at combourg the same day at the same hour at the same altar in the chapel belonging to the castle they wept and so did my mother i was much surprised at their grief but i now understand it i am never present at a baptism or a marriage without a smile of sadness or experiencing a feeling of oppression at my heart next to the misfortune of having been born i can imagine none greater than that of giving birth to another this same year a change took place in my mind as well as in my family chance threw into my hands two books of a very opposite tendency the one an unrevised horace the other a history of confession mal faite the revolution caused in my ideas by these two books is indescribable a new world opened before me on the one hand i suspected mysteries incomprehensible at my age an existence different from my own pleasures beyond my boyish games and charms of an unknown nature in a sex of which i had known only a mother and sisters on the other hand spectres dragging chains and vomiting forth fire announced to me eternal torments for a single unconfessed sin i could not sleep i fancied i saw black and white hands passing across my curtains i pictured to myself that the latter were cursed by religion and this idea increased my horror of those infernal spectres i sought in vain in heaven and in hell for the explanation of this twofold mystery attacked at once morally and physically my innocence still strove with the storms of premature passion and the terrors of superstition henceforth i experienced that youthful ardour which is the transmission of life i could explain the fourth book of the aeneid and read telemachus suddenly i discovered in dido and in eucharist beauties which enchanted me and became sensible to the harmony of those exquisite verses and of that ancient prose i one day translated the aeneidum genitrix hominum divumque voluptas of lucretius at sight with so much animation that m ego suddenly snatched the book from my hands and plunged me into the rudiments of greek i procured a tibulus by stealth when i arrived at the quam juvat imites ventos audiri cubantem those sentiments seemed to reveal to me my own nature the volumes of massillon which contained the sermons on the magdalen and the prodigal son i read unceasingly i was permitted to turn over those leaves for it was little suspected what interested me there i stole the little ends of the wax tapers from the chapel in order to read at night those seductive descriptions of the disorders of the soul i fell asleep muttering incoherent phrases in which i tried to infuse the sweetness the numbers and the grace of that writer who has best rendered into prose the euphony of racine if i have succeeded in painting with some truth the conflict of christian convictions with the disorders of the heart 
I am persuaded that I owe this success to the chance which made me acquainted at the same moment with two opposing empires. The ravages which a bad book produced in my imagination found their corrective in the terrors inspired by another book, and which spoke the more forcibly from the softness excited by undisguised representations. End of chapter 10《Chapter Eleven》Chapter Eleven of the Memoirs of Chateaubriand, 1768 to 1800. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. Memoirs of Chateaubriand, 1768 to 1800 by Francois René de Chateaubriand. Chapter Eleven. Dieppe, end of October 1812. Adventure with the Magpie's Nest. Third vacation at Combourg. The Quack. Return to college that which is said of misfortunes that they never come singly may be equally applied to the passions they arrive together like the muses or the furies with the sentiment which had begun to torment me a feeling of horror arose within me an elevation of soul which keeps the heart incorruptible in the midst of corruption a corrective principle springing up by the side of a devouring impulse as the inexhaustible source of those prodigies which love demands of youth and of those sacrifices which it imposes the students of the college always took walks on thursdays and sundays when the weather was fine we were often conducted to mount dol on the summit of which were some gallic roman ruins from this isolated hill the eye wandered over the sea and the wide marshes where during the night danced those will-o'-the-wisps kindred spirits of those magic lights which now burn in our lamps another favourite walk was to the meadows which surrounded the seminary of eudistes so called from eudes a brother of the historian mesurai and the founder of their congregation one morning in the month of may the abbe ego prefect for the week had conducted us to this seminary we were allowed great liberty at play but were expressly forbidden to climb the trees the prefect after having brought us to a grassy spot quitted us to repeat his breviary the road was lined with elms at the very summit of the tallest of these trees a magpie's nest caught our eye we were in ecstasies pointing out to each other the mother sitting upon her eggs and were seized with an overwhelming desire to obtain possession of this splendid prize but who would dare to risk the adventure the orders were so peremptory the prefect so near the tree so high all hopes were centred in me i could climb like a cat i hesitated but the love of glory prevailed i took off my jacket and clasping the elm commenced the ascent the trunk was without branches until about two-thirds of its height from which issued a forked branch on one of the points rested the nest my comrades assembled beneath the tree applauded my efforts looking alternately at me and in the direction whence the abbe might surprise us fluttering with joy at the hope of obtaining the eggs and trembling with fear at the possibility of punishment i approached the nest the magpie took flight i seized the eggs put them into my bosom and descended unfortunately i attempted to slide down my feet slipped round the elm and i lost my footing the tree being lopped i could not rest my feet either on the right side or on the left in order to raise myself and catch hold of the upper branch and there i stuck fifty feet in the air all at once there was a cry of the prefect the prefect and as is usually the case i saw my first self faithfully abandoned by my friends one alone named le gobien endeavoured to assist me but he was soon obliged to give up his generous attempt there was but one means of escaping from my vexatious position which was that of suspending myself backwards by catching with my hands one of the forks of the branch and then endeavouring to seize with my feet the trunk of the tree below the bifurcation this manoeuvre i executed at the peril of my life in the midst of my distress i did not cast away my treasure it would however have been wiser to have thrown it away than many others that i have since flung from me in descending the trunk i skinned my hands scratched my legs and breast and broke the eggs it was this that betrayed me the prefect had not seen me on the elm i could have concealed from him that my hands were bleeding but there was no possibility of hiding the bright golden colour with which i was besmeared come along sir exclaimed he you must be caned had he announced to me that he would commute this punishment into a sentence of death i should have felt a sensation of joy i had never experienced such an ignominy throughout my wild education at any period of my life i should have preferred any punishment to the horror of being put to the blush before a fellow-mortal my breast heaved with indignation i replied to the abbe in the tone of a man and not of a child that neither he nor any other person should ever dare to raise his hand against me this answer provoked him he called me a rebel and promised to make an example of me we shall see i replied and began to play at ball with a sang-froid which confounded him we returned to the college the abbe made me enter his apartment and ordered me to submit 
my lofty bearing gave place to a torrent of tears i represented to the abbe that he had taught me latin that i was his pupil his disciple his child that surely he could not dishonour his child and render the sight of my companions insupportable to me that he might put me in prison and feed me upon bread and water deprive me of recreation load me with pensums that i should be grateful for his clemency and love him all the better i fell at his feet clasped my hands and besought him in the name of jesus christ to spare me but he was inexorable to my prayers and entreaties i rose in a rage and gave him such a violent kick on his shins that he uttered a cry and ran limping to the door which he double locked and returned i entrenched myself behind his bed he struck at me with his ferula across it i wrapped the quilt around me and animating myself to the combat cried out macte animo generose puer this piece of boyish erudition made my opponent laugh in spite of himself he proposed an armistice we concluded a treaty i agreed to submit to the arbitration of the principal without acquitting me altogether the principal made no difficulty in excusing me from the punishment which i held in such utter abhorrence when the worthy priest pronounced my acquittal i kissed the sleeve of his robe with so much fervour and poured forth such heartfelt effusions of gratitude that the good man could not help giving me his benediction thus terminated my first combat in defence of that honour which had become the idol of my life and to which i have so often sacrificed repose pleasure and fortune the vacations during which i entered my twelfth year were very triste the abbe le prince accompanied me to combourg i never went out except with my preceptor and we took long walks together without aim or object he was dying of consumption and was silent and melancholy and as for me i was scarcely more gay than he was we would walk for whole hours behind one another without speaking a word one day we lost our way in the wood monsieur le prince turned to me and said which road must we take i replied without hesitation the sun is setting at this time it always shines on the window of the great tower let us go in that direction in the evening monsieur le prince related this incident to my father who saw the future traveller in this evidence of intelligence often when i have seen the sun set in the forests of america i have called to mind the woods of combourg my recollections echo each other the abbe le prince wished my father to give me a horse but in his opinion it was not necessary that a naval officer should understand the management of anything except his ship i was reduced to ride one of the large carriage horses an immense piebald this piebald was not like that of turenne one of that species named by the romans desultorius equus and trained to aid their master but a mad pegasus who was quite unmanageable at a trot and almost broke my legs when i obliged him to leap the ditches i have never cared much for horses although i have led the life of a tartar and in opposition to the effect which my education in this respect might naturally have been expected to produce i sit on horseback with more grace and security the tertian egg of which i had contracted the germs in the marshes of dol relieved me of the company of monsieur le prince a man who sold infallible remedies was passing through the village my father who had no opinion of physicians had great faith in charlatans he sent in search of the quack who declared he could cure me in four and twenty hours next morning he returned dressed in a green coat laced with gold a large powdered wig white dirty muslin ruffles false diamond rings old black satin breeches bluish white silk stockings and shoes with enormous buckles he drew back the curtains of my bed felt my pulse told me to put out my tongue uttered some gibberish with an italian accent on the necessity of drugging me and then made me swallow a piece of sugared stuff this met with my father's approval for he stoutly maintained that all maladies proceeded from indigestion and that every description of physical suffering might be driven away by clearing a man of everything except his blood half an hour after i had swallowed the drug i was seized with the most alarming vomitings Monsieur de chateaubriand on being informed of this was ready to throw the poor devil out of the turret window the quack in his terror threw off his coat tucked up his shirt-sleeves and made the most ridiculous gesticulations at every movement his wig turned round in every direction he re-echoed my cries and exclaimed que monsieur lavandier this monsieur lavandier was the village apothecary who had been called in to render assistance in the midst of my agonies i knew not whether i should die from the drugs of the charlatan or the fits of laughter into which his absurdities threw me the effects of this violent emetic were happily arrested and i was again set upon my legs life is spent in hovering round our tomb our very sicknesses are but the winds which carry us more or less near to the haven the first death which i witnessed was that of a canon of st malo he lay expiring on his bed his countenance distorted by the last convulsions death is our friend nevertheless we do not recognize it as such because it presents itself to us under a mask and that mask inspires us with terror i was sent back to college at the close of autumn 
End of chapter 11. Chapter 12 of the Memoirs of Chateaubriand, 1768 to 1800. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. Memoirs of Chateaubriand, 1768 to 1800 by Francois René de Chateaubriand, Chapter 12. Vallée au Loup, December 1813. Invasion of France, Games, the Abbe Chateaubriand. From Dieppe, where the injunctions of the police had compelled me to take refuge, I was permitted to return to the Vallée au Loup, from which place I now continue my narrative. The ground trembles beneath the tread of the foreign soldier, who is at this moment invading my native country. Like the last of the Romans, I am writing amid the noise of invading barbarians. By day I trace pages as agitated as the events of that day, and at night, when the sound of the distant cannon has died away in the woods, I return to the silence of those years which sleep in the tomb, to the peace of my youthful souvenirs. How circumscribed and brief is the past of our existence, compared with the vastness of the present and the importance of the future. Mathematics, Greek, and Latin occupied me at college the whole of the winter. The time that was not consecrated to study was devoted to those games of early life which are the same in all countries. The young Englishman, the young German, the young Italian, the young Spaniard, the young American, the young Bedouin, alike trundle the hoop and throw the ball. All brothers of one large family, children do not lose their traits of resemblance till they lose their innocence, and this rule obtains everywhere. However, diversities arise in nations, because the passions are modified by climate, government, and manners. The members of the human race cease to understand each other, and to speak the same language. Society is the true tower of Babel. One morning I formed one of a party that was playing at prisoner's base with very much animation, in the great court of the college, when a message was brought that I was wanted. I immediately followed the servant to the outer gate. I here found a tall, florid man, of brusque and impatient manner, and a gruff voice, with a stick in his hand. He wore a black untidy wig, a cassock torn and tucked in at the pockets, dusty shoes and stockings out at heel. Young Polisson, said he, are you not the Chevalier de Chateaubriand de Combourg? Yes, sir, replied I, perfectly astonished at his interrogation. And I, exclaimed he, much excited, I am the last senior of your family. I am the Abbe de Chateaubriand de la Guerande. Look at me well. The haughty Abbe thrust his hand into the pocket of his ancient shag breeches, took out a dirty crown piece of six francs wrapped in a greasy piece of paper, flung it at my head, and continued his journey on foot, grunting his matins with a ferocious mien. I afterwards learned that the Prince de Condé had offered this rustic vicar the preceptorate of the Duc de Bourbon. The arrogant priest replied that the prince, possessor of the barony of Chateaubriand, ought to know that the heirs of that barony might have preceptors, but were not the preceptors of any person. This hauteur is a family failing. In my father it was perfectly odious. My brother carried it to a ridiculous extreme, and his eldest son is somewhat tainted with it. I am not sure whether, in spite of my republican opinions, I myself am altogether exempt from it. However, I most studiously conceal it. End of chapter 12chapter thirteen of the memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicole lee memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred by francois rene de chateaubriand chapter thirteen my first communion departure from the college of don the period of my first communion approached the moment when it was customary for the family to decide what should be the future career of the child. This religious ceremony superseded, among young Christians, the taking of the virile robe among the Romans. Madame de Chateaubriand came to be present at the first communion of her son, who, after having dedicated himself to God, was to be separated from his mother. My piety appeared to be sincere. I edified the whole college. My views were ardent. My repeated fasts were carried to such an extent that they frequently gave my preceptors uneasiness. It was feared that I should carry my devotion to extremes, but my fervour was tempered by enlightened religion. My confessor was the superior of the seminary of the Eudistes, a man of about fifty years of age, of an extremely stern aspect. Whenever I presented myself at the tribunal of penitence, he interrogated me with great anxiety. Surprised at the trivial nature of my faults, he knew not how to reconcile my distress with the insignificance of the secrets which I deposited in his bosom. As Easter approached more nearly, his questions became more urgent. 
do you conceal nothing from me exclaimed he no my father have you not committed such or such a fault no my father my invariable reply was no my father he dismissed me sighing and doubting his look scrutinizing the very depths of my soul and as for me i quitted his presence pale and harassed as if i had been a criminal i was to receive absolution on holy wednesday i passed the night of tuesday in prayer and in reading with terror the book called confession malfait on wednesday at three o'clock in the afternoon we set out for the seminary accompanied by our parents all the vain eclat which has since been attached to my name could not inspire madame de chateaubriand with half the pride which she felt at that moment when as a christian and a mother she saw her son about to participate in the great mystery of religion on my arrival at the church i prostrated myself before the high altar where i long remained as if annihilated when i rose to go to the sacristy where the superior was waiting for me my knees shook under me i threw myself at the feet of the priest and it was with the greatest difficulty that i was able to articulate my confitior well exclaimed the minister of jesus christ have you not forgotten anything i was mute his questions recommenced and the fatal no my father issued from my mouth he drew back and asked counsel of him who conferred upon his apostles the power of remitting and retaining sin then making an effort he prepared to give me absolution if a thunderbolt had fallen upon me i could not have been more terrified and i cried out i have not told you all this keen-sighted judge this delegate of the sovereign arbiter whose visage inspired me with such fear suddenly became the most tender pastor he embraced me and bursting into tears exclaimed come then my dear son take courage and tell me all i never passed such a moment in all my life if the weight of a mountain had been taken from me i could not have felt more relieved i sobbed for joy i venture to say that on this day i was made an honest man i felt that i never could survive remorse what then must be the feelings of that man who has been guilty of crime if i suffered so severely for childish frailty and how divine is that religion which can thus master our best affections what moral precepts can ever supply these christian institutions the first of all made all the rest cost me nothing and my secret delinquencies at which the world would have laughed were weighed in the balance of religion the superior was greatly embarrassed he wished to defer my communion but i was about to quit college and to enter the navy with extreme sagacity he discerned in my youthful tendencies insignificant as they were the bent of my inclinations he was the first to penetrate the secret of what i should hereafter become he divined my future passions he did not conceal the good that he saw in me but he at the same time pointed out the bad qualities with which i should have to contend there is he concluded no time for you to do penance but you are washed from your sins by a courageous though tardy avowal then raising his hand he pronounced the formula of absolution and now the second time his arm of thunder descended on my head like the dews of heaven i inclined my head to receive it i seemed to share the joy of angel i ran and threw myself on the bosom of my mother who was waiting for me on the steps of the altar i no longer appeared the same to my masters or my schoolfellows i walked with a light step raised head and joyous countenance in all the triumphs of repentance on the following day holy thursday i was admitted to that touching and sublime ceremony which i have in vain attempted to portray in my genie du christianisme here again i might have found my wonted petty humiliations my bouquet and my dress were less handsome than those of my companions but on this day all was to god and for god i perfectly realized faith the real presence of the victim in the holy sacrament of the altar was as sensible to me as the presence of my mother at my side when the host was placed upon my lips i felt as if enlightened within i trembled with awe and the only material thing which occupied my mind was the fear of profaning the sacred wafer le pain que je vous propose c'est aux anges d'aliments dieu lui-même le compose de la fleur de son froment racine at this moment i understood the courage of the martyrs and could have confessed christ on the scaffold or in the midst of lions i love to recall this happiness which briefly preceded in my soul the tribulations of the world compare its joys with the transport which i have depicted see the same heart experience in the space of two or three years all that is lovely and salutary in innocence and religion and all that is seductive and melancholy in passion choose between these two joys you will see on which side you must seek for happiness and above all for repose three weeks after my first communion i quitted the college of doll even now i retain a pleasant recollection of that institution childhood itself lends a charm to the places which it has embellished as a flower imparts its perfume to the objects which it has touched 
i linger yet in thought on the dispersion of my first comrades and of my first preceptors the abbe le prince who was appointed to benefice neuron died soon after the abbe ego obtained a cure in the diocese of rennes and i witnessed the death of the excellent principal abbe porcher at the beginning of the revolution he was a learned man gentle and simple-hearted the memory of this obscure rollin will always be cherished and venerated by me End of chapter thirteen chapter fourteen of the memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicole lee memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred by francois rene de chateaubriand chapter fourteen valerie close of december eighteen thirteen combourg college of rennes meeting with Gérille, Moreau, Limolin, marriage of my third sister. At Combourg, I found that which nourished my piety, a mission in which I followed up my religious duties. I received confirmation on the perron of the castle, with the peasant boys and girls, at the hand of the bishop of Saint-Malo. After this, a crucifix was erected, and I assisted in holding it, while it was being fixed on its base. It still exists. It rises before the tower in which my father died for thirty years it has not seen a human face at the window of that tower it is no longer saluted by the children of the chateau every spring it waits for them in vain it sees only the returning nightingale companion of my childish days more faithful to its nest than man to his home happy if my life had glided away at the foot of this crucifix if my hair had been blanched by the days which clothe with verdant moss this venerated crucifix i soon set out for wren there i was to continue my studies and finish my mathematical course for the purpose of subsequently undergoing an examination in order to become a naval cadet at brest m de fayol was principal of the college of rennes this tuy of bretagne boasted of three distinguished professors the abbe de chateaugiron for the second the abbe germet for rhetoric the abbe marchand for philosophy there was a great number of students both boarders and day scholars and the classes were full in later times, Geoffroy and Gangrenet of this college would have done honour to St. Barbe and Plessy. The Chevalier de Pagny had also studied at Rennes. I occupied his bed in the chamber that was assigned to me. Rennes seemed to me a complete Babylon, and the college a world. The number of masters and scholars, the extent of the buildings, gardens and courtyards, appeared to me boundless. Gradually, however, I got accustomed to all. On the birthday of the principal we always had a holiday and sang with all our might some splendid verses of our own composition in his praise, or we used to say, O Terpsichore, O Polymni, venez, venez, remplis nos ver, la raison même vous convie. I acquired the same ascendancy over my new comrades, which I had formerly had over my schoolfellows at Dole, but it cost me a good many blows. The youngsters of Bretagne have a very peevish temper, hence we used constantly to send each other a challenge on walking days, appointing a meeting in the woods of the benedictine gardens called the tabor we fastened our mathematical compasses to the end of a stick or we engaged in single combat more or less rude or courteous according to the nature of the challenge umpires were appointed who decided which should throw the gauge and in what manner the champion should take the lead the combat did not cease till one of the parties declared himself vanquished i found my friend Gerille at this college and as at st malo he presided at these engagements he was my second in an affair which i had with st river a young gentleman who became the first victim of the revolution i fell under my adversary refused to surrender and my pride cost me dear i said like jean de Maest, when going to the scaffold i cry for mercy to none but god at this college i met two men who afterwards became celebrated for very different causes moreau the general and limoila the inventor of the infernal machine now a priest in america there is only one portrait in existence of lucile and this wretched miniature was done by limoila who became an artist during the revolutionary distresses moreau was a day scholar limoila a boarder it is rare to find at the same time in the same province in the same little town under the roof of the same college such remarkable destinies I cannot help here relating a trick which my companion Limoilin played off upon the prefect of the week. 
the prefect was accustomed to make his rounds in the corridors after we had retired to see if all were right and used to look in at a hole which had been made in each door for this purpose les moulins gerille saint rival and i slept in the same dormitory d'animaux malfaisants c'était un fort bon plat we had in vain stopped up the hole with a piece of paper several times the prefect pushed aside the paper and found us dancing about on our beds and breaking the chairs one evening du moulin without telling us of his project prevailed upon us all to get into bed and then put out the light very soon we heard him get up go to the door and then creep into bed again about a quarter of an hour after we heard the prefect walking along the passage upon tiptoe just as if he had some cause for suspecting us he stood still at the door listened peeped in and not perceiving any light who in the world has done that cried he rushing into the chamber de moulin was stifled with laughter and gerille speaking through his nose said in a half silly and half bantering tone what's the matter monsieur le prefet as for saint rival and me we laughed till we were half choked and hid ourselves under the cover the prefect could not get anything out of us we were quite heroic all four were accordingly consigned to prison in the cellar here saint rival scooped out the earth under a door which communicated with the lower court he contrived to get his head jammed into this opening when a hog ran up to him and attacked his head gerald glided into the college wine cellar and set a cask of wine running de moulin demolished a wall and as for me a second parent d'ondin scrambling about in an air-hole i collected a crowd of canaille in the street by my eloquent harangues the terrible inventor of the infernal machine playing off this polisson trick upon the prefect of a college calls to mind young cromwell scratching with ink the face of another regicide who signed next to him the sentence for the execution of charles the first although the education which we received at the college of rennes was very religious my fervour relaxed the great number of my tutors and schoolfellows were so many causes of distraction to me i made considerable progress in the study of languages and was a proficient in mathematics for which i always had a decided turn i should have made a capital officer of the marine or of engineers i had a natural aptitude for everything i was equally alive to the grave and the gay i commenced with poetry before i got into prose the arts were my delight and i was passionately fond of music and architecture though very liable to get tired of anything i was capable of the most minute details being endowed with patience which was proof against every obstacle though fatigued with the object with which i was occupied my perseverance was greater than my repugnance i have never given up anything which was worth the trouble of finishing and there are some things which i have persevered in for fifteen and twenty years of my life with as much ardour on the last day as on the first this aptitude was also manifested in minor things i was quick at chess adroit at billiards hunting military exercises and was a tolerable draughtsman i should have been a very good singer if my voice had been cultivated all this added to the tone of my education and the life of a soldier and traveller prevented my feeling anything like pedantry or of assuming the dogged self-satisfied air the awkwardness and slovenly habits of other men of letters far less the haughtiness and assurance envy and vainglorious conceit of modern authors i passed two years at the college of rennes gerald quitted it eighteen months before me and entered the navy julie my third sister was married in the course of this time she was united to the count de farcy captain in the regiment of conde and settled with her husband at fougeres where my two elder sisters mesdames de marigny and de quebriac already resided the marriage of julie took place at combourg and i was present at the wedding i there met the countess de Tronjoli, who afterwards distinguished herself so greatly by her intrepidity upon the scaffold she was a cousin and intimate friend of the marquis de la rouerie and was implicated in his conspiracy i had never before seen beauty except in my own family and was confounded now to perceive it in the countenance of a stranger every stage of my life opened a new perspective before me i heard from afar the seducing voice of the passions which were about to overcome me and i flung myself at the foot of these sirens attracted by an unknown harmony it turned out that like the chief priest of eleusis i had different incense for each divinity but the hymns which i sang while burning this incense could they be called balmy like the poesy of the hierophant end of chapter fourteen chapter fifteen of memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org 
Recording by Nicole Lee. Memoirs of Chateaubriand, 1768 to 1800, by Francois René de Chateaubriand. Chapter 15. La Vallée aux Loups, January 1814. I am sent to Brest to undergo the examination for a naval cadet. The harbour of Brest. Another meeting with Gérille. La Perrousse. Return to Combourg. After the marriage of Julie, I set out for Brest. On quitting the large college of Rennes, I did not feel the regret which I experienced on leaving the little college of Dol. Perhaps I had no longer that innocence which flings a charm over all. Time had begun to remove its defences. My mentor in my new position was one of my maternal uncles, the Count Ravenel de Boiteau, chief of the squadron, one of whose sons, a very distinguished officer of artillery in the army of Bonaparte, is married to the only daughter of my sister Julie, the Countess de Farcy. On my arrival at Brest, I did not find my brevet d'aspirant. I know not what accident had delayed it. I was therefore what is called soupirant, and as such exempt from regular study. My uncle boarded me in la rue de Siam at a table d'hôte of aspirants, and presented me to Count Hector, the commandant of the navy. Left to myself for the first time, instead of joining my future comrades, I shut myself up in my instinctive solitude. My ordinary society was confined to my fencing, writing, and mathematical masters. The ocean which I was to meet with on many shores bathed at breast the extremity of the Amoricaine peninsula. Beyond this fallen there was nothing but a boundless sea and unknown worlds. My imagination revelled in this illimitable space. Often, when seated on the Quai de Recouvrance, have I watched the movements of the crowd, shipbuilders, sailors, soldiers, douaniers, and galley slaves, passing and repassing before me. Voyagers embarked and disembarked, pilots issued their directions, carpenters squared pieces of timber, rope makers twisted cables, sailor boys lighted fires under huge coppers, whence issued a thick smoke of the sanitary odour of tar. Loads were being carried backwards and forwards from the vessels to the warehouses, and from the warehouses to the vessels. Bales of merchandise, sacks of provisions, trains of artillery. Carts were going into the water, or returning to receive fresh loads. Tackles were raising heavy burdens, while the cranes were letting down huge stones, and the mudsuckers were removing the slough. The forts made reiterated signals, sloops went and came, and vessels were getting under way, or entering the basins. My mind was full of vague ideas of society, its advantages and its evils. I know not what fit of melancholy seized me. I quitted the mast where I was seated, and, ascending by the penfeld, which empties itself into the harbour, reached a point where I lost sight of the port, no longer able to see anything but a greensward valley, though still hearing the confused murmur of the sea, and the voices of men. I threw myself down on the banks of this little river now watching the running water, now following with my eyes the flight of the seagull, enjoying the silence that reigned around me, or listening to the blows of the caucus hammer, I fell into a profound reverie. If in the midst of this reverie the wind carried the sound of some gun of a vessel getting under sail, I trembled at every limb, and my cheeks were bedewed with tears. One day I had wandered to the verge of the river on the seaside. It was extremely hot, and I stretched myself on the shore and fell asleep. Suddenly I was awakened by a magnificent sound, I opened my eyes, like Augustus, to see the triremes in the anchorage of Sicily, after the victory over Pompus Sextus. Volleys of artillery rapidly succeeded each other. The roadstead was covered with ships. The French squadron sailed in after the signature of the peace. The vessels manoeuvred under sail, enveloped themselves in fire and smoke, hoisted their flags, presented the poop, the prow, the flank, and stopped short in the midst of their course by throwing out the anchor, or continued to fly over the buoyant waves. Nothing ever before gave me such an exalted idea of the human mind. Man seemed to borrow at this moment something of the greatness of him who said to the sea, Non procedis amplius. All breast hurried to the shore. Sloops detached themselves from the fleet and landed their crews at the quay. The officers with whom they were crowded and whose faces were bronzed by the sun had that foreign air which is contracted in another hemisphere the je ne sais quoi of gaiety pride and boldness of men who had returned from re-establishing the honour of the national flag this naval corps so meritorious so illustrious these companions of the la motte piquets the souffrants the dukes de Coedy, the estaing who had escaped from the fire of the enemies were to fall beneath that of the french i saw this valorous troop defile before me suddenly one of the officers quitted his companions and rushed to embrace me it was Gerille. 
He was much grown, but he looked weak and languid from a sword thrust which he had received in his breast. That same evening he quitted me for the purpose of visiting his family. Since that time I have seen him only once, and this was shortly before his heroic death. I will afterwards relate the particulars. The sudden apparition and departure of Gerial made me adopt a resolution which changed the whole tenor of my life. It was decreed that this young man should have an absolute empire over my destiny. It has been seen how my character was formed, what was the turn of my ideas, what the first attempts of my genius, for I must speak of it as of an evil. For such has been this genius, rare or common, meriting or not meriting the name I have given it, for want of another word to express myself. Had I been more like other men, I should have been happier, and he who could have slain my talent without robbing me of my mind would have been my best friend. When the Count de Boiteil took me to Count Hector, I heard the officers, old and young, recount the adventures and talk over the countries which they had traversed. One had arrived from India, another from America. This one had come to equip himself for a voyage round the world. Another was about to return to the Mediterranean and visit the shores of Greece. My uncle pointed out to me in the crowd La Perouse, that second cook, whose death is a secret of the storms. I heard all, I saw all, I spoke not a word, but that night I did not close an eye. My imagination revelled in battles and in the discovery of unknown lands. Be this as it may, seeing Gerald return to his parents, I resolved that nothing whatever should hinder me from rejoining mine. I should have liked the navy much, had not my spirit of independence unfitted me for service of every kind, for I had within me an invincible impossibility to obey. Travels tempted me excessively, but I thought I should not like them, unless I could go alone and follow the bent of my own inclinations. In fine, giving the first proof of my inconstancy, without informing my uncle Ravenel, without writing to my parents, without asking permission of any one, without waiting for my brevet, I set out one fine morning for Combourg, where I arrived as unexpectedly as if I had dropped from the clouds. I am astonished to this day how, in spite of the terror with which my father inspired me, I could have the audacity to take such a step, and more surprising than all was the manner in which I was received. I might have expected transports of rage, but I was welcomed with kindness. My father contented himself with shaking his head, as if to say, Here's a fine affair. My mother embraced me cordially, but grumbled all the time, and my Lucille was in an ecstasy of joy. End of chapter 15chapter 16 of the memoirs of chateaubriand 1768 to 1800 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by nicole lee memoirs of chateaubriand 1768 to 1800 by francois rené de chateaubriand chapter 16 montboissier july 1817 the promenade apparition of combourg from the last date of these memoirs, Valet au Loup, January eighteen fourteen, till that of this day, Montboissier, July eighteen seventeen, three years and six months have passed. Have you heard the Empire fall? No. Nothing has disturbed the quietude of this region. The Empire is crushed, however. The immense ruin has fallen during my life, like Roman remains overturned in the bed of an unknown river. But great events signify little to him who does not depend upon them. A few years issuing from eternity will rectify all these rumours by an interminable silence. The preceding book was written during the expiring tyranny of Bonaparte, and by the light of the last rays emitted by his glory. I begin the present book in the reign of Louis Eighteenth. I have viewed kings closely, and my political illusions have been dissipated, like these agreeable chimeras, of which I continue the recital. Let me say first of all why I resume my pen. The human heart is the sport of everything, and one can never foresee what trifling circumstance may cause its joys or its griefs. Montaigne has remarked this. A cause is not requisite, says he, to agitate our minds. A reverie without cause or subject can govern and agitate them. Meanwhile, here I am at Montboissier, on the confines of La Beauce and Perche. The chateau on this estate, the property of the Countess of Colbert Montboissier, was sold and demolished during the Revolution. There remain only two pavilions, separated by a railing, and formerly occupied by the porter. The park, now à l'anglaise, retains some traces of its ancient French regularity. Straight walks and copses enclosed by hedges give it a sombre air. It pleases the eye like a ruin. Yesterday evening I was walking alone. The sky was like one in autumn, a cold wind blew at intervals. 
I stopped at an opening in the wood to look at the sun. It was sinking in the clouds above the tower of Alu, from whence Gabriel, then its tenant, had also looked upon the setting sun two hundred years ago. Where are now Henry and Gabriel? Where I shall be when these memoirs are published. I was disturbed in these reflections by the singing of a thrush from the highest branch of a birch tree. This magic sound immediately recalled to memory my paternal home. I forgot all the horrors of which I had been the witness, and suddenly transported in imagination into the past, I again revisited those scenes where I had so often heard the same sweet song. Then, whilst listening to it, I had the feeling of melancholy which I experience now, but the former sentiment arose from that vague desire of happiness common to the inexperienced heart that which i now felt was caused by having proved and judged of the value of human life the voice of the bird in the woods of combourg presented to my mind a vision of happiness which i hoped to attain the same voice in the park at montboissier recalled to memory the days lost in the pursuit of that unseizable happiness i have no longer anything to learn i have travelled faster than others and have made the tour of life time flies and drags me onward i cannot even reckon on being able to finish these memoirs how often have I begun to write them, and where shall I finish them? How many times shall I approach the entrance of the forest? Let me profit by the short time which remains. Let me hasten to paint the days of my youth, whilst yet the prospect is distinct. As some navigator, in leaving for ever an enchanted region, writes his journal in view of that shore which fades from his sight, and will soon disappear. End of chapter 16